A reading from God's Word through the prophet Joel, chapter 2, beginning in verse 28. And it shall come to pass after these things that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, There shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. The word of the Lord. A reading of Acts chapter 2 verses 14 through 24, and then verses 32 and 33. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning and welcome. I'm so appreciative of the invitation to speak, the assignment to speak, (laughs) Um, also the um, musical accommodations for some songs that I requested, and also those who make the programs, Kristen, Christy, um, who work so hard so that we can have um, everything that we need to make this an excellent worship experience. I want to um, draw your attention to the front of the program. This is, um, this is a mosaic on the, uh, the inside top of a church, for, uh, per- Felicitas and Perpetua in procession. You can see that they are dressed in gold. They're in heaven, and they are carrying their martyr crown to the Lord. They're in a procession of probably 12 or 13 women on that wall. There's a facing wall of just as many men who, are, who were martyred and who are all carrying their crowns forward to lay them at Jesus' feet. It's wonderful. Thanks, Kristen. I also appreciate the um, worship guide. I hope you have a chapel of the, I mean, a copy of the chapel worship guide as well. 
that talks about the series that we're doing on martyrdom. I also want to draw your attention to the uh, frame and the dome with the two young women, Perpetua and Felicitas. That's who we'll be talking about today. And as I speak, um, feel free to look. I mean, if you're, not, if you're looking up there, not at me. That's fine with me. I'd, I'd rather that, actually. Um, and I, what I want to do today, um, I'll probably go over maybe, I hope not, but what I, I do want to do is to um, explain a number of the things that are up there in the, um, what we call the iconographic program of that frame. So every now and again I might refer to that and I hope that you will feel free just to gaze up there and also at Christ and the um, cloud of witnesses around us. It's a somber day today, isn't it? A somber occasion. As we think about 9-11, two years ago, 9-11 fell on a Sunday. Our family lived in Pennsylvania at the time, and we wanted to visit the field in Shanksville, the crash site of Flight 93. It was a Sunday memorial service, and um, I wanted to get there the night before so I could be sure to you know, get a good seat inside. I didn't know how large it was going to be. As it turns out, it was out in the field, so I didn't have to worry. We were right out there um, on folding chairs in a field of fragrant wildflowers, with lots of grasshoppers, and a light drizzle. But we wanted to pay our respects along with others from all corners of American culture. There were military, first responders, bikers, airline personnel, Mennonites, politicians, victims' family members, and average U.S. citizens like us. I, I, was so I am so impressed by the story of Flight 93 that had been hijacked and turned around purportedly to return to Washington, D.C. and hit the Capitol. The passengers on board, having made phone calls and discovered other events of the morning, decided to take action. Realizing that they had no hope for survival, they didn't wait for anyone to decide their fate for them, but they converged as a community, they considered their options, and they voted on a plan after which they were galvanized into action by the now famous words of Todd Beamer, a Christian, on the flight, are you ready? Okay, let's roll. Those passengers struck America's first blow at the terrorist network behind the attacks. If Flight 93 really was intended for the Capitol building, this small army of passengers and crew foiled their plans big time. And not only that, but nobody on the ground was killed. No casualties at all. This past Sunday, I discovered that a new structure had been dedicated at the site to the heroic passengers. It's described as a gleaming concrete and steel structure that climbs 93 feet into the sky, and it's called the Tower of Voices. Have you seen this? Have you heard of this? The Tower of Voices. The Tower of Voices features a wind chime for each person on board. There were 40, uh, with its own distinctive sound. Susan Miller of USA Today writes, the voices on board Flight 93 are seared in Americans' memories. Voices from private voicemails to family members and loved ones and emergency recordings like 911 calls. One family member said, we don't look at the passengers and crew as victims. We look at them as heroes. For him, the purpose of the memorial is this, to remember to remember September 11th and the sacrifices of all the heroes that were present that day. Most importantly, he says, when visitors walk away, I hope that they take with them a question. If it was me, could I have done what they did? In other words, he hopes that the experience will engender a measure of deep self-examination. I think I like the way the park superintendent, Stephen Clark, summed it up. This is what he said. Together, their voices will ring out into perpetuity with this beautiful Somerset County, Pennsylvania wind. Well, today we are remembering another set of voices. We're listening to another set of voices today through the reading of a personal account of martyrdom. The date of this martyrdom is not fully secure, but by best estimates, it was March 7, 2000, 203, not 2003, 203. I'm sure there were some people martyred in 2003, however, tragically. On this date, at least five newly baptized catechumens were martyred in a Carthaginian arena, together with their teacher, Saturus. 
We may hear some of their voices as we read aloud the account that Perpetua recorded in her diary and the church preserved, translated, read, and transmitted across numerous generations. However, the main actor, if we can call it an actor, in the account, both for us and for the martyrs and for the editor or the, the redactor who frames the narrative by introduction and conclusion is this person, the Holy Spirit. That's the main actor. The redactor, who some believe might have been Tertullian, but that's not, there's no consensus on that. But the redactor weaves together so skillfully and densely an introduction to the narrative that expresses the necessity of remembering the Holy Spirit's works in ancient times. Um, and um, remembering how they were edifying and um, how, how they have um, priority over modern times. But he says, what about the Holy Spirit's work among us today? Why should we not acknowledge the Holy Spirit's work in contemporary times? These works of the Spirit which we witness should be recorded and collected and read because they bring not glory to the martyrs, they bring glory to God. They bear witness to unbelievers, they edify believers, and they result in full communion of the whole church on earth and in heaven and with our triune God. And I want to read some of these, some of these ancient words. They're not inspired, but they're ancient. If ancient examples of faith which both testify to God's grace and edify people are collected in writing so that by reading them as if by bringing to life the events again, God is honored and humans are strengthened simultaneously, what about new instances? Why should they not be collected if they're suitable for both purposes? They should be not least because these modern stories and examples will one day themselves become ancient and available for posterity, even though in their own time they may have been less venerated due to our preference for antiquity. But we should be careful if we consider the Holy Spirit's power to be one and the same at all times and in all seasons, then it makes sense that some later events must also be esteemed as being closer in time to the end times with respect to the grace of God planned for the end of the world. For, he says, as it is written, in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and their sons and their daughters shall prophesy. And upon my servants and my handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. The Joel passage was important to the writer, to the redactor of this account. And so, he continues, we acknowledge and reverence both ancient prophecies and modern visions as equally promised to us. And we consider all the powers of the Holy Spirit who was sent for the church to administer all gifts in all people, however the Lord distributed them. We collect these instances and we commemorate them in reading them together to God's glory. We don't want anyone's faith to weaken or grow despondent in supposing that the Holy Spirit was active only among the ancients, only back in Joel, only back in the Acts of the Apostles. I just added that. <laughs> Whether this work led to the courageous witness of martyrs or the work that bestowed revelations, since we know that God always fulfilled his, his promises as a testimony, as a witness, as a martyria to unbelievers and as an edifying work for believers. And then he kind of launches into 1 John. And we, therefore, what we have heard and handled, declare also to you, brothers and little children, so that you who are familiar with these events by having witnessed them may be reminded of them once again to the glory of the Lord. And those who only heard about them may hear of them again and have communion, have koinonia, communio, with the blessed martyrs and through them with the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor forever. Amen. Behind the prologue's ending is 1 John and the fellowship of those who witness by seeing, hearing, and touching the word of life, their fellowship with the recipients of the letter, the congregation. And it culminates in the completion of fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, as we see in verse 3, evidence of which comes by the Holy Spirit. So we're Trinitarian now. 
the Holy Spirit given by the Father in the Son's name. The result is that God is in the believer and the believer is in God through love and complete joy and confidence on the day of judgment. And this comes in 1 John 4. I realized this dependence on 1 John late in the game, so really my sermon would have been doubled if I had realized it earlier. So we can thank the Holy Spirit that he only um, showed me that much later. Well, we talked a bit about um, 1 John, but the more explicit focus in this passage is on Joel 2, 28 to 32, which in the Hebrew version is set off by itself. It's a a small five-verse chapter. It's effectively Joel chapter 3, followed by 4, which is our chapter 3. That's just to say that the Hebrew confirms what we already knew, that those five verses are special, and uh, they're set set apart like this as a pericope. So what does Joel prophesy, and what does Peter in Acts 2 believe to apply to the nascent church at Pentecost? God promises through Joel a special and powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit poured out like the blessed rains on the parched and locust-devastated land. After this, Joel says, God's Spirit will be poured out, quite democratically actually, upon all humanity, irrespective of gender on sons and daughters, irrespective of age on old men and young men, irrespective of socioeconomic status on male and female slaves. In other words, the spirit will be manifest universally through visions, prophecies, and dreams without sexism, ageism, or classism. Can I get an amen? The Spirit's coming is associated with eschatology and the end times, and indeed they they will be apocalyptic times, as Joel tells it. The signs of God's presence appear in the dramatic altering of creation, but God's hand is also evident in the salvation of his human creation. It will be a time of universal reckoning for sure, the awesome and dreadful day of the Lord. And yet, there is mercy for those who cry out to God. He will save those who call on the name of Yahweh. The key verse in Joel connecting to the perpetual account is actually verse um, 27, which we didn't read, but it goes like this. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. This was so important for the martyrs, especially as they were in prison, um, in a place that was, that was dark, that was disrespected. You know, no respectable person is found in prison. But for them to know that the power of the Spirit was with them was very important and was very evident to them. The miraculous prophecies, visions, and dreams evidence God's powerful presence among his people. As with the disciples at Pentecost, so with the martyrs of Carthage in the early third century, the power of the Spirit was with them among the, um, among the congregation, and it fueled their witness in word and prophetic vision and deeds. Well, to the narrative. I'm sure you've been waiting for this part. <laughs> This little work is a gem. Um, It's endured so long, I think partly due to its simplicity, which is nevertheless pretty complex and multi-layered. Sometime in February, perhaps of AD 203, five baptismal candidates were arrested, including a woman named Vibia Perpetua. The account of the martyrdom says that she is respectably born that she has um, a mother and father who are respectable, that she has um, two brothers, one of whom is a catechumen, um, that she's educated, that she's married, and that she has a son who was an infant at the breast. And she herself was about, he says, 22 years of age. It seems that the catechumens were under house arrest for a while, during which time her father was called in to dissuade her from her rash judgment, and he appears several times throughout the narrative, but is unsuccessful at changing her mind. A few days later, the catechumens are baptized, and Perpetua is told by the Spirit in baptism that she is chosen for martyrdom. Later, they're moved to to the prison and held until their public trial before the procurator, Hilarionis. The martyrs were ordered to offer sacrifice, which they refused, were asked if they were Christians, which they affirmed. 
they were condemned to the beasts at a show that would take place on the emperor's son's birthday, and they were held in prison until that day. Perpetua, in prison, has several visions. Also while in prison, Felicitas prays to give birth before the day of execution. She is eight months pregnant and would not be executed with the others, according to Roman law. They couldn't execute a pregnant woman. She would have to deliver and then be executed by herself, but she still has a month to go. You know. um, the martyrs then pray fervently for Felicitas to deliver, and she does. On the, day, <clears throat> on the day of the show, all manner of beasts are let loose on the martyrs. A bear, a leopard, a mad cow, and eventually all are close to death when they are run through by the sword through the throat. <clears throat> Well, I want to identify some emergent themes uh, from the text. And these themes basically center around what I'm going to call identity shifts. See, these are catechumens who were just saturated now in the scripture, in Christian doctrine, in the creed. They were learning and they were identifying powerfully with Christ and with the people of God over the time of studying in the catechumenate. Sometimes this took a couple of years. Okay. So they're, they're well taught, I think. This shift in Perpetua is the Spirit's work within her, drawing her, calling her to a new identity, a new set of values, and new communal, social, and spiritual ties. The first shift. Perpetua goes from a daughter of Roman Carthage to becoming a daughter of God. And this is shown in her several uh, discussions with her father. In the first one, uh, it's a confrontation. Her father comes to her while under house arrest, and um, Perpetua says, my father, for the sake of his affection for me, was persisting in seeking to turn me away and to cast me down from the faith. Father, I said, do you see, for example, this vessel lying here? Do you see it to be a pitcher or something else? And he said, I see it to be so. It's a pitcher. And I replied to him, can it be called by any other name than what it is? And he said, no. Neither can I call myself anything else other than what I am, a Christian. Then my father, provoked at this saying, threw himself upon me as if he would tear my eyes out. But he only distressed me and went away, overcome by the devil's arguments. Can you imagine? This man is, he is called the paterfamilias. He is not just the head of the household in an economic way. He has the power of life and death over everybody in that household, children and adults included. Um, he, he's angry with her, and he's absolutely exasperating, exasperated. Um, another time that he comes to her, and he, he pleads with her as a daughter, it's just heartrending and um, you know, I, I also had a strong relationship with my father before he passed away, and so I brought some Kleenexes up here just in case I might need them as I read this to you, but I'm going to press through. My father came to me from the city, worn out with anxiety. He, he thought that they were going to be um, hauled up and have to um, be on trial. He came to me that he might cast me down, saying, Have pity, my daughter, on my gray hairs. Have pity on your father, if I'm worthy to be called a father by you. If with these hands I've brought you up to the flower of this age, if I've preferred you to all your brothers, do not deliver me up to the scorn of men. Have regard to your brothers. Think of your mother and your aunt. Think of your son, who will not be able to live without you. Lay aside your courage and do not bring us all to destruction. She said, my father said these things in his affection, kissing my hands, throwing himself at my feet, and with tears calling me not daughter, but lady. And I grieved over the gray hairs of my father, that he alone of all my family would not rejoice over my passion. And I comforted him, saying, on that scaffold, whatever God wills shall happen, for know that we are not placed in our own power, but in that of God. That's not the answer of a daughter to her daddy, is it? 
That's somebody who is moving to a different identity. She's gone from a daughter of Roman Carthage to a daughter of God. The last time that her father sees her, after this other encounter where he's just hysterical, throwing himself down, very unseemly for a Roman man, the last time he sees her, there's not even any speech. He comes, he starts to pull his hair, he throws himself down, he's pulling out his beard, he's basically performing mourning rituals, mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. He knows that he's lost her. She's, she's gone completely from him. She has identified powerfully with her new family and with her new father. And he doesn't know it, but in the meantime, in between these encounters with her earthly father, she's experienced several awesome visions of a blessed place that is her destiny on the other side of her ordeal. The first such prophetic vision comes in answer to a request made by other catechumens. And the question is this, will this whole ordeal result in a passion, in a suffering, or in an escape? And Perpetual boldly asks the Lord, and she receives this vision. And this is kind of what's represented up there at the top. She said, I saw a golden ladder of marvelous height, mere longitudinous, a very long ladder. Everything in her dream is huge and disproportionate. She said it reaches up even to heaven and very narrow so that persons can only ascend it one by one. And on the sides of the ladder was fixed every kind of iron weapon. There were swords, lances, hooks, daggers, so that if anyone went up carelessly or not looking forward, he would be torn to pieces and his flesh would cleave to the iron weapons. And under the ladder, you can just see it behind the banister there, under the ladder itself was crouching a dragon, a draco, or a serpent of enormous size, mere magnitudinous, who lay in wait for those who ascended and frightened them from going up. Her teacher, Satyrus, went up first, the one who had subsequently delivered himself freely on our account, not having been present at the time that we were taken prisoners. And he got to the top of the ladder and turned towards me and said, Perpetua, I'm waiting for you, but be careful that the dragon does not bite you. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall not hurt me. And from under the ladder itself, as if in fear of me, he slowly lifted up his head. And as I trod upon the first step, I trod upon his head and I went up. I went up and I saw an immense extent of garden, a huge garden. And in the midst of the garden, a white-haired man sitting in the dress of a shepherd, very, very tall, milking sheep. And standing around were thousands of white-robed ones. And the shepherd raised his head and looked upon me and said to me, Welcome, child. Welcome, daughter. And he called me over. And from the cheese as he was milking, he gave me, as it were, a little cake. And I received it with folded hands. And I ate it, and all who stood around said, Amen. And at the sound of their voices, I woke up still with a sweet taste in my mouth, which I can't even describe. And I immediately related this to my brother, the catechumen, and we understood that it was to be a passion. And we ceased henceforth to have any hope in this world. Her dream rings true. It's not how it is in, in, in dreams. Images and thoughts and rituals from her waking life are conflated with her thoughts about her spiritual life and the decisions before her day by day in the situation of crisis. Everything she sees is huge. She thinks of baptismal rituals, of being given milk and honey after baptism. And I, I think I heard this right, but I think I saw the text to say that she was given a piece of cheesecake. And I'm very happy about that. I was happy about heaven anyway, but I'm even happier now. I hope that one's true. In any case, key for our point here <clears throat> is the address by the shepherd, obviously Christ. And he says, welcome, daughter. After this vision, <clears throat> it's clear to her that this future, what she saw there, is what shortly awaited her and that by God's power, the persecuting force working against the church is defeated. 
she is empowered to trot on him and to progress boldly towards God. <clears throat> a further identity shift happens in her next dream vision, just before the day on which they would fight in the arena. She dreams that she's taken hurriedly on different passages um, to the amphitheater by a deacon from their church, and she's dropped off right in the middle of the amphitheater and, and left alone. And as he leaves her, he says, do not fear. I am here with you, and I am laboring with you. And again, she sees a huge crowd, but no beasts. So she is puzzled because she knows that's her punishment. She's going to be handed over to the beasts. And then she sees an opponent coming at her, and the nature of the combat becomes quite clear. This was going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat, kind of like MMA. If anybody watches that, I don't, but I've heard of it. <laughs> so she says, there came forth against me a certain Egyptian, horrible in appearance, with his backers to fight me. And there came to me as my helpers and encouragers some handsome young men, and I was stripped, and I became a man. It's interesting. Then my helpers began to rub me with oil, as is the custom for contest, by the way, the word agon, where we get agony. And I beheld that the Egyptian, on the other hand, was rolling around in the dust. And a certain man came forth of wondrous height, huge, so that he even overtopped the top of the amphitheater. And he wore a loose tunic, he had shoes of gold and silver, and he carried a rod as if he were a trainer of gladiators. And he had a green branch upon which there were apples of gold, which you can see in the frame. And he called for silence, and he said, This Egyptian, if he should overcome this woman, shall kill her with the sword. And if she shall conquer him, she shall receive this branch. And then he departed. Well, how does that work? So if he wins, she dies, and if she wins, she just gets the prize and he doesn't, and he, he doesn't have to die. Um, a couple weeks ago, Dr. George told us about the army of Christ. It's the army that sheds no blood. Their blood is shed, but they don't shed blood. And I think this uh, kind of comes out right here in this, in this section. She says, we drew near to one another and we began to deal out blows. And here she's like a, a wrestler and a gladiator. He sought to lay hold of my feet while I struck at his face with my heels. Then something happens that's the stuff of virtual reality. And I was lifted up into the air, and I began to thrust at him as if spurning the earth. And when I saw there was some delay, I joined my hands together, I twined my fingers together, I took a hold of his head, and he fell on his face, and I trod on his head. Same phrase as before. And the people began to shout, and my backers began to exult, and I drew near to the trainer, and I took the branch. And he kissed me and said to me, Daughter, peace be with you. And I began to go gloriously to the gate of life, and I woke and perceived that I was not to fight with beasts. Well, she was going to fight with beasts, but not really with beasts is what she's saying but against the devil. And still, I knew that the victory was awaiting me. Another confirmation of her full identification with this new family it shows up here, a new father. But most importantly, we see here her identity shift from the feminine mother of an infant to a masculine and muscular arena wrestler. It's weird. This is the image of a wrestler, a gladiator, an MMA champion, a powerful athlete, Yes, even a soldier of Christ. Still, the battle is not won in her own power, we notice. The power to rise up and strike the opponent in the face and eventually step on him comes from outside herself, assume, assumedly from the divine figure, the Holy Spirit, who said he would be laboring with her. In this vision, Perpetua comes to see herself as she truly is, spiritually and powerfully victorious. And she is pumped. She enters the arena the next day. The account says she has a shining face. She is bright, joyful, bold, calm, singing psalms, and knowing that already as she enters the arena, she is crushing the head of the Egyptian. 
but we don't want to leave out Felicitas. She also has her backstory, and she also has an identity shift from a pregnant mother and slave to a gladiator going from the labor of childbirth to fight the beasts, from, as the narrator says, from the blood of the midwife to the gladiator to wash after childbirth with a second baptism. When arrested, Perpetua could legally not be executed uh, until a month later. Dr. George told us a couple weeks ago that lots of different kinds of people were executed in the arena after the gladiatorial games. And some were criminals, and some were slaves, and some were Christians. And these, this group of Christians here, these catechumens, don't want Felicitas to be by herself. Um, they want to be together so that they can encourage each other. When she's in labor, Felicitas's words are not the words of a weak slave woman, and I want to share them with you. When she was in labor giving birth, one of the soldiers standing around in the prison, probably a young guy, said, well, you're suffering now. What are you going to do when you get thrown to the beasts? You didn't think about that when you refused to sacrifice. And she replied, now it is I that suffer what I suffer. But then there will be another in me who will suffer for me because I also am about to suffer for him. Well, Felicita's words are those of a spiritually powerful woman fully identified with Christ's sufferings. In real life, I would say, though, on the outside, as they were seen by the crowd, the crowd saw them very differently. On the day of the contest, they were stripped, they were wrapped in nets, they were led along to be attacked by a wild cow, apparently. The audience saw them as pathetic. They saw them as pitiable, though, which is unusual for the crowds, because the crowds come on purpose to the amphitheater to watch people die. That's what they're going for, the gore, the bloodshed, and the killing. That's why they're there. Okay. Um, the women were, were thrown around some. Perpetua went to Felicitas and lifted her up. And in the account, it says that Perpetua rose up. When she saw Felicitas crushed, she approached and gave her her hand and lifted her up. And both of them stood together. And the brutality of the people being appeased, they were recalled to the gate of life. In the end, both women had their throats cut and died in the arena. But through the journal and the edited work, their voices come down to us today and leave us with a few of what I'm going to call um, revelations and lessons. So, from long ago, revelations of Perpetua. Number one, the gospel is an equalizer, and so is martyrdom. Choosing to follow the gospel is costly, but eternally rewarding. There is a reciprocity, we should call it a covenant, between the Lord and his people. They honor him as Lord above every earthly power, and he pours out his favor through his spirit, who sovereignly distributes gifts to edify and increase the church, Christ's communal body on earth. Second, the Spirit still gives visions and dreams to encourage, refresh, and reveal. These revelations are not new or counter to the Scripture, but they sometimes, like in a dream, they reveal our inner selves, and sometimes they reveal spiritual truths that we do not readily perceive in our waking life. I would say we can extrapolate two big lessons out of this. Number one, if the same Holy Spirit is working then as now, and now as then, he is sovereign over the way that he works. He reveals and reminds of truth. He leads into all truth. He testifies to Jesus and reveals him to people. And we should take care not to dogmatically circumscribe the Holy Spirit's methods because he works in many ways, in various situations. And might I add, he doesn't consult with us and our expertise. He also works through persons and through, through vessels of his own choosing, and our responsibility is to recognize those giftings and encourage their use as a testimony to unbelievers and as edification for believers and for the church as a whole. 
Second lesson, we are part of greater spiritual realities than we realize, both good and bad. I'm going to start with the bad. In this life, the struggle we experience, the contest which we, the contest which we fight, um, the warfare that we wage, both individually and collectively, is in a cosmic arena that we don't always see. We don't always perceive it as such. Perpetua, little by little, understood that behind her father's opposition and arguments, even though he loved her, and she knew that, her, his arguments to dissuade her, behind the persecuting emperor who styled himself as the Egyptian god Serapis, that's what Severus did, behind a pagan idolatrous world order hostile to the Christian message, and yes, even behind the mauling beast of the arena stood someone else, and that is the devil. We pray the Lord's Prayer today, deliver us from evil. In the Romanian church that I grew up in, the translation is deliver us from the evil one. Not just from evil in general, but the evil one who is behind all evil. We don't always see spiritual realities as they are, but the Spirit can open our eyes, can convict us of sin, can remove distractions so that we might see things as they truly are, so that we might address them, so we might steel ourselves to fight, not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and high places, right? So that's the bad. The good is that Beyond the powers and principalities, beyond he that is in the world, is one who is an overcomer, the overcomer. One who has overcome the world, who has broken the power of death and its sting, which is sin. And who offers rewards to those who overcome, as we see in Revelation 2 and 3. When this word is used over and over, the overcomer, the victor, will receive the crown of life or a new name. Christians... Uh, conform themselves by sacrificial discipleship and witness, whatever form this might take, to this one who is in us and is greater than he who is in the world. This is the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ, the partaking of his sufferings that Christians engage in, and the joy of the new life that he offers. Further, the communion of saints on earth and and the um, the, the preview of communion with them in heaven opens us up to think of the church not only as those saints that we see, but others who live beyond this life, the church at rest, as we call it, the invisible church. In other words, the church is bigger, stronger, more powerful than we know. And from these documents, we can hear these saints' voices still ringing out in witness in perpetuity. And I'm going to allow the redactor of this account to have the last word as he says in his conclusion, O oh, brave and blessed martyrs, he's not praying to them, just saying, O oh, truly called and chosen unto the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, whoever magnifies and honors and adores him surely ought to read these examples for the edification of the church not less than the ancient ones, so that new virtues may also testify that one and the same Holy Spirit is always operating even up until now, even up until now. And God the Father omnipotent and his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, whose is the glory and infinite power forever and ever. Amen.